morning. Welcome to stand together if you wish. We're going to worship God. for our welcome and announcements. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Uh, happy Mother's Day thank you. It's kind of cloudy out there, but we don't have to be cloudy in here. We're happy, we're family, we're together. That's something to really be blessed with. Uh, this morning we're going to have Dr. Tim Brooks, and congratulations, Tim, on receiving your doctorate just recently. Uh, who is, he's going to be sharing a message with us today. He's the pastor of the South Portland Church of the Nazarene, and he has pastored in other Nazarene churches in Kansas, Ohio, Florida, and Maine. He's a graduate of Olivet Nazarene University and Nazarene Theological Seminary. He's married to Sharice, and they have two beautiful daughters, Claire and Mackenzie. Uh, please be in prayer for our main district assembly. Um, we have two of our ladies going, Darlene and Brenda, correct? Um, that is uh, May 19th and 20 through the 21st. It's at the Fairfield Church of the Nazarene. Uh, everyone is welcome to go to the services in the evening, also ordination service on Saturday. <clears throat> so please be in prayer for them as they travel there. Dr. David Graves will be presiding over the assembly. And it's getting summertime, it's getting warmer, so we're going to be getting busier. And Family Fun Day is coming right up by Saturday, June 18th. Uh, unfortunately, the Sears will be unable to coordinate this this year, so we still have people that come and enjoy looking for us and having our, our shortcakes, and we don't want to just forget it. So we're going to need many hands to get things prepared. We are still going to have a booth there. Uh, we need people that are going to serve and sell, and we also need, we may still need somebody that's going to feed the dogs up there, and I think I know who that'll be, but uh, we had a great time last year, fur friends and two-legged friends were there, and we had a great time, so we'll uh, be putting a sign-up sheet up next week for everybody to sign up on what they can do, whether it's preparing, volunteering, selling shortcakes, whatever, and also... Our daily devotionals are in the foyer, the todays. 
They are very, very handy to people. People look forward to getting them all the time. If you need to take two or three and give them to people, that's fine. Um, please do that and use them because they're very, very helpful to you. And on Tuesday, um, we've been, they've been having a prayer session here. Uh, and uh, I was told this morning something that's pretty neat is they start praying and they walk around to the different pews where they know people normally sit and pray for those individual families and pray for people that aren't here. They also pray for the board, which we need. And uh, it seems like they're really having a great time. So Tuesday, 7 o'clock, right? 7 o'clock here at the church. Um, come by and just pray. You don't have to stay for a long period of time. Stay for whatever you want to stay for. And uh, our donation yacht sale is coming up. And that's a win-win situation all around. You get rid of things in your house that you don't want. Uh, people from the community and even from other communities stop by, and they're able to get things that they may not be able to be afford full price. So get, they name what they think it's worth to them, and that's what we take. And the kids win because we use that. We use the monies that we get from that for scholarships for our kids to go to camp. And then what's left over, we take it to the Salvation Army so other people are getting use of that at a, at a low price. So time to clean out and bring it out. We'll, uh, we'll have a great time July 9th, and it's uh, from 9 to 2. And also uh, more, more on the kids' stuff. We have uh, a container in the library. This year the kids' mission project is power, and it's kids reaching kids. It's putting Bibles into hands of kids or Bible resources that they may not otherwise have. We're very, very blessed in that our children are able to read the Bible whenever they want. Um, they're able to listen to people that can preach from the Bible. But there's other kids around the world that can't do that. There's kids right in the United States that can't do that because they don't have the resources. So we have a, a change thing out there that you don't want to sit in church and have the pastor here change jingling around in your pocket. So... Why not come in through the, build it, through the door, get rid of it, and put it in the container out there? You don't have to worry about it. And there's bracelets out there that have power on it. It has Mark 12, 24 on it. And there's also bookmarks that anybody can use a bookmark in their Bibles. And, and when they open your Bible, you'll, it'll just remind you of that, that there are kids around the world that don't have those resources. Uh, I think that's it for the announcements. No, it is not. There is one more. Uh, we have people in the church that are doing things every single week. Diane has a lot that she has on her plate. If you would like to learn how to do the bulletins, learn how to do doing ushering, doing reading, reading the announcements, please let us know because we can use the people. Um, pray about it. Uh, if you feel like you can help do any of these and to fill in, uh, John may not hit, be here some week. We need somebody to fill in leading the music. So if, if you think that that's something you could do, please let us know. I think that's it. Oh, see, sea dogs is Saturday. Yay. Um, we have one ticket that one of our people purchased and said to give it to somebody. Um, so we have a ticket available. Uh, if you would like to go, and if you haven't gotten your tickets yet for Saturday, Diane has them. But we also have that one ticket. So if anybody's interested, just let her know, and uh, it's going to be a great time. We've ordered good weather. Um, hopefully we will get it. But it really doesn't matter because we'll be under the building, and we can watch the game from there. Kids can run out and catch the balls. They don't care. So uh, let us know if you would like to have that ticket or if you need to pick up your tickets. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the service. We pray that God would add his blessing to our hearts to receive his word as we have a call to worship from Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. 
Shout to God with cries of joy, for the Lord Most High is awesome, the great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us and peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Amen.
ourselves before you because you are worthy. Because you are so worthy and you are so good. I know this is why we have come before you this morning. Because of what we can give, we intend to do so. And knowing that you are worthy to receive all glory and dominion and honor. And we are grateful to bring what we can. Amen. And we ask the ushers to come forward and give us opportunity to worship in tithes and offerings also as well.
seated and attend for our lessons today. The first reading today comes from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdoms of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has, sent, has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way. You have seen him go into heaven. Good morning. Good morning. Our second reading today is from Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inher inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. May God bless the reading of this word. Please stand with us as we sing our hymn this morning. <laughs>
receive our message today. Good morning. It is so fantastic to be with you today. Thank you for extending the invitation for me to join you. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We share denominational identity. We share uh, geographical identity. We are all in this together, and it is my joy to be sharing that with you today. As was mentioned earlier, I am the pastor at South Portland Church of the Nazarene. That's my day job. Uh, my evening job is chasing after an eight-year-old and a five-year-old girl, and so I've learned that what comes with that is balding, and I'm suffering through that currently. Well, I've been here before many times. Your former pastor, uh, John and Melody, were good friends of mine. I've been in the sanctuary a few times to see my daughter in a recital, playing the piano right over here. So I am comfortable with this place and with you all. Recently, I sat down with your church board as well and talked to them a little bit about the future and where God is leading and what God is doing. And uh, it is my joy to, um, to be even a small part of that. Like I said, we are all on the same team. And my understanding, the concern I think is what I sat down with them, both on behalf of the church and them, is, well, is South Portland interested in taking over? Well, no, I have... I have plenty of problems on my own. <laughs> plenty of problems. You can have some of the problems if you'd like to boost your attendance. I'm just playing. I, this is being recorded. I should be careful. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, oh, the second most long-winded pastor is preaching over there right now, so they're still in service. <laughs> but I, I want to extend to you just friendship. Nothing more and nothing less. Friendship. Um, my conversation with uh, the church board is that we, we're willing to send some of our pastoral staff to come over and preach amongst you, and we're going to be just having preachers come. But the concern that I heard is that you didn't want each Sunday to feel like a new church, a different preacher, all this. And so the, the cooperation we came to is that we would try to send preachers for three or four weeks at a time so that there'd be some coherence. And so I've developed a schedule over through the summer that uh, I'm going to be sharing with your church board secretary this, this week. It's published and written, where um, there will be someone who is a qualified, licensed, educated pastor from our church coming until you all are able to find a preacher of your own and a pastor of your own. And my understanding in talking to Cecil Jones, our district superintendent, is that there is a name coming to you. And um, this particular person and couple gets my full endorsement. I really believe in them and, and hope that you'll see uh, their potential as well, and that name will be coming to you in just the next couple of weeks. And so I really believe in the potential of fit for this person and their skill set. And so I am praying for you as you're in this season of looking for a new pastor. And my hope is, is that as a new pastor comes here, my hope and my prayer is that we can find new and fresh ways to partner with each other. Like I said, we're on the same team. We are not overlords down the street. Uh, you are not the small congregation that we're trying to steal people from. We are friends. We are in this together. And uh, my goal and my dream is to see so much of this, uh, this cape and peninsula that we share geography with just captivated by the message of holiness through, uh, through partnership, through friendship, through evangelism, and seeing people find the Christ who sanctifies holy ho through and through through our combined ministries, whatever that looks like, separate most of the time, together sometimes, uh, potentially mentoring new pastors and sharing information and resources. But uh, all in all, I, I'm here to be your friend. And, and I, hope, I hope you feel and experience that today. And I want you to know that I'm an open book. I'm willing to be asked questions. And, and Diane, she quite knows how to get in touch with me. So if you have any questions, ask me today as we leave. If anything pops into your head, tell her to send me a message. She knows how to find me. And um, I, I hope that in any way, in every way, I can be a support to you. But today we're going to be uh, just looking at uh, the scriptures together. And the second reading this morning was the reading that uh, I want to preach over from Ephesians. And so if you wanted to turn there and uh, fact check me, I invite you to do so. Uh, we'll be looking at the first chapter of Ephesians today. 
In our society, we are inundated with pop culture, of course. And pop culture references I find to be very, very interesting at different times. Uh, now, my particular purvey of pop culture these days, I told you about my eight-year-old and my five-year-old, so we watch a lot of Disney. And so Disney pervades my life view right now. And so I, I end up telling a lot of Disney stories, unfortunately, for my church. They know all about the princesses. I have educated them all so very well. But today I want to talk about a particular scene in the movie Lion King. Have any of you seen this movie before? Oh man, most of us, that's really good. Okay, good. Uh, there's, this, there's this scene in The Lion King, one that has always kind of captured my imagination, where Simba has been very bad. He's the Lion King. He's the child. And his dad, Mufasa, has caught him and has risked his own life in order to save him. And Simba, it turns out, is very scared, not near as brave as he should be as a lion. And he asks his dad, what's going to happen when you're no longer here to protect me? What in the world are you, what am I going to do when big, bad, scary dad can't jump the hyenas anymore? What am I going to do then? And Mufasa tells him this story. It's a little new age and spiritual, but about, tells him to look at the stars, right? You remember this? Look at the stars. All of the stars are the kings that have gone before us. And you can rely on the power and the strength of the kings, reminding of where they've been, what they've done, and who they're here for you. And Simba finds great strength and power in this. Recently, a Star Wars movie came out. Any of you see the Star Wars movie? <laughs> oh, less. All right. Lion King is more popular than Star Wars. You might be the only group in America where that's the case. <laughs> that's all right. So I don't want to give up too much about this Star Wars movie since many of you haven't seen it, but um, basically uh, the new character picks up the lightsaber that was Darth Vader's and Luke Skywalker's and holds it and this flashback happens where suddenly she recognizes something is happening in her and she has no idea what. Why is it she can see the past? Why is it she feels powerful in this moment? What is going on? In our pop culture, in the movies we watch, the stories we watch, we like this story of power has gone before us and transfers to us. That is a theme that happens over and over and over. Power was, I feel inadequate, but somehow I can rely on the power before me in order to help me moving forward. This is a particularly important theme for Christians as well, isn't it? This is a theme and a story we've been telling for 2,000 years, particularly because it's easy to follow Jesus as he suggests over and over and over in the Gospels when he's marching through the streets of Jerusalem, when he's following the paths from Nazareth to Capernaum, when he is even walking on water in the lakes. You can imagine stepping on top of it when you see him. But how do you follow Jesus when he has been crucified, buried, risen to new life, and then ascended to God? What in the world does follow me mean at that moment? We talk a lot about following Jesus. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I am a follower of Jesus. I will go where you go, Jesus. I will do what you do. But how in the world do we imagine this now that there is not dust kicking off his sandals as we head around the town with him? And this is a particular problem that Paul... And the other writers of the New Testament inherited it in a way that they never would have imagined. You see, their expectation as they were writing these epistles that we have was that Jesus was going to come back any day for the second coming and take care of them. And each day that came and went, came and went, came and went, they got a little more confused at what in the world Jesus was talking about. And the further they got from Jesus marching around the countryside of Israel, the more they needed to start talking about what does it mean to be a Christian in this world? Well, Jesus is away. What does it mean to have a Christian ethic? What does it mean to have Christian behavior? How should the church act? What is the church? And these questions became very important. And much of the epistles in the New Testament is about answering this very question. How do we follow Jesus when we can't follow Jesus? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a really bad follower. I know a few of you are really bad followers as well. So, not that I'm talking about anyone in particular. 
I'm a really bad follower. Now, especially when you make something competitive, I'm an especially bad follower. As in, I don't like to follow the rules if it means I don't win. All right, any of you like this? Couple, okay, good, good, good. At least work together. Yeah, I see more fingers being pointed around. <laughs> All right, we're in this together. We're in this together. This started when I was a child, even. Uh, I, I remember a time when I was about eight years old playing a game called Blind Man's Bluff. You ever play this game, right? It's kind of like tag with a blindfold. I think they don't play it anymore because it's profoundly unsafe, all right? And I found out how unsafe it was. My dad was a military man, so we always lived in military housing, and military housing is not particularly well constructed. And so the house I lived in was actually made of wood on the outside, and it was probably rotted. It was painted this real bright red. This was in, right outside of Boston, actually. And, and I was told, as they put the blindfold on me, you are not to run. Do not run. And, and I, I understood the rule. It's not that my brain couldn't comprehend the rule, but what I couldn't comprehend is how I was going to win if I wasn't faster than everyone else. They were all running. How in the world was I supposed to catch running people if I was to walk? And so I did what the only thing my brain could comprehend. I ran. And I ran in spite of everyone yelling at me. They were just mad because I had figured the game out. And I just ran and ran and ran until I heard my mom screaming, Stop! Now, my mom screamed at me a lot. And the word stop came out of her mouth regularly. But I kept running until I went face first into the side of my house. And I, I ran at full speed into a house. I had red splinters in my gums from this. I did not pass out or black out, thank God. I don't know how I didn't. But face first into the side of my house. That is how I follow. And even to this day, I still struggle. And, and, and frankly, I will follow very, very well as soon as you can answer one question for me. One question. Why? You answer why for me, and I am your number one follower. Number one follower. I will go wherever you want to go if you can answer why to me. Now, many of us follow Jesus in just such a way today. He's not anytime soon, going to show up in downtown Cape Elizabeth and have a little jaunt around so we can get and follow the leader him. That's not going to happen. And the further we get away from the epistles, the more we find we have new problems and fresh problems. And, and, and frankly, it gets more and more and more confusing of what in the world does it mean to be a Christian the further we get away from Jesus and the less and less likelihood that we're actually going to be able to see him face to face in this life. So we begin to write songs about how great it'll be when Jesus descends because then everything will make sense. We'll be able, right now we're just we're living blindly. We're following as best we can, but what are we following? We're trying so hard and yet the word on the news is that there's lefty Christians and righty Christians and the conservative coalition and those liberal Christians and the more and more it's like what in the world are we as the church? We've got no good answers for anything because we can't just ask Jesus. We can't just follow him. We can't just sit around the fire and ask him, what's your take on the transgender bathrooms at Target? Man, it would be so much easier if we could just get a written, signed answer from him of how to behave, right? So we do the best we can. We read the scriptures. We make guesses. We come up with strong ethics. And we follow them to the best of our abilities. But it's hard, isn't it? And so fortunately, we have this text that we have in Ephesians today that gives us hope that perhaps there's a chance for us as Christian people today. Because the writer of Ephesians, which I hope I'm not breaking news to you, probably wasn't Paul, even though it says Paul at the very beginning. 
They had these things called pseudonyms where they, the followers of the people would write the letters and use their name. This was perfectly acceptable in like the year 70 AD. But if you use someone's name today, you would be in huge trouble and likely to be sued. This was very common in that day to use the authority of the person you followed or, disciple, or were discipled by in order to let your letter stick. Many scholars today don't believe this was written by Paul, but this was written with the full authority of Paul. And so we understand this to be an authoritative text written in the first century sometime. And they offer us these gifts in Ephesians chapter 1. Wisdom and revelation in verse 17. Oh, could we use some wisdom and revelation when we're trying to follow Jesus without following a body? He offered us that we might know God enlightened by the eyes of our hearts. Oh, could we use knowing God in our world today? Verse 18 was that. So, uh, the, the enlightened eyes of our heart is so that we may know the hope in which God called us better. Also, the riches of his in glorious inheritance in the saints is his, and his in, in, incomparably great power, in verse 19, that is working of his might and strength. These are gifts that are given to us through the Spirit in a post-Pentecost world after Jesus has ascended to the Father. These are the gifts that we are given in order to navigate a world in which we can't just follow Jesus around. And these are important, important gifts for us. Enlightened eyes of our hearts, wisdom and revelation, knowing God, hope. These are the sort of things that we receive in order to figure out what in the world does it mean to be Christian in the year 2016. And we need to learn again as a church, I think, to follow these gifts. We, uh, we so often, this is the part that's going to get me in trouble, okay? We so often look to Fox News and CNN to remember what it is we believe. It is so often that we turn to the news, to our political party of our choice, to imagine what it is we believe, and then we justify that based on scriptures that we can find. What would happen again as the church if we first turned to the wisdom that God has given us. If we prayerfully imagine what God is doing in our world. Because the fact of what Ephesians is trying to get at to us today is this. Is that while Christ is away, this season of the history of the world in between the ascension and the second coming, Ephesians is reminding us that we still have access to God and that God is still active and that Christ is still on the throne and that in spite of the fact that it is confusing and there are hard questions and being a disciple of Christ is kind of a muddied, confusing concept in our world today, God is not distant. God is near. And so while we sometimes as Christian people sort of fall back on fear and confusion of what in the world to do in this world. We can be reminded by our text that in this season between the ascension and the return, that God is still working and present in our world. But we need to put on better eyeglasses to see where God is. We need to put on better, better hearing aids to hear where, what God is saying. Because God's presence is near and it's manifest. And using our own imagination and our own wisdom has not gotten us very far. In fact, it appears to be hurting us. Have you seen any of the newspaper articles? Have you seen the news? Have you read the sociological studies about how the church is doing in the United States of America? It's not pretty. And my theology doesn't give me space to say that that's God's fault. My theology says... We are not living up to the calling that God has given us. And so as this text comes to a conclusion, we're given yet another tool to put in our toolbox. One more tool. And it's that it's this, that we are the body of Christ. The church, those of us who gather at Cape Elizabeth Church of the Nazarene on a day like this, we are not simply the church looking for a Jesus to follow but we have been embodied into the very body of Christ. And if God can look upon the body of Christ, his son, 
and see its faithfulness to the point that the world can kill it. And he raises that dead body to new life. And then not only that, but he takes that new life of the resurrected Christ and ascends it to a throne in heaven and allows it to rule over the world. If we are given the good news that we are the body of Christ, what does that mean that God can do amongst us today? I don't believe that God was a one-off resurrection wizard. I believe that resurrection is God's specialty. I believe that when God looks at things that are dead and dying, like the church in the United States of America, like the call to holiness among Christian people, when God looks upon that, he doesn't look upon it with the despair that we tend to look on. He looks upon it on yet another thing that he can bring life to, that which people are calling dead. And so if we are to truly be the body of Christ, if we are truly to be the body of Christ, that means the Spirit of God has indwelled us in a very important and special way. And that while there isn't a Jesus from Nazareth for us to follow, God's Spirit can be that which penetrates into us and drives us to be a particular kind of people in a particularly backward sort of world. And that should give us hope that God is not finished with us yet. God still has plans. God still has life to give, even in the midst of a world that seems to be declining and struggling. And so from now on, As we watch the news and read our newspaper and have our coffee and talk to our neighbors, as there are so many issues that divide us in so many ways and spaces and things that we just wish God would give us all the answers to, who's our next pastor going to be? Which bathroom do we use? (laughs) Which candidate should we vote for? Are we going to be socialist or capitalist in the United States of America? These are, these are very, very real questions that we live with day to day to day. And so often we just want to say, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. But what if that prayer didn't simply mean, come and take us home, Jesus? But what if that prayer meant, lead us on? What if that prayer meant embody us again? Fill us with your spirit again. Let us stop being the followers and let us start being the leaders by the sake of us following the spirit which is in this world. What would it look like if the church started behaving like that again? Rather than reacting to every problem that comes along and trying to be yet another voice with a bullhorn in a world full of bullhorns. What if instead we took on the very role of Christ, who Philippians said was given the seat next to God and yet emptied himself and became a slave, even to the point of death on a cross? Man, that's a different sort of way of living than we try to live in our world today. Think of the Christians whose name you know. Franklin Graham, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, they've all got bullhorns. They've all got bullhorns. Who are the Christians who are following the model of Christ, accepting the call to death and the role as a slave in order to let God be glorified through their life? Where are those Christians these days? I'm sure they're out there, but there's no glory in it. Your name isn't written on the side of books when you live like that. But the kingdom of God is real in places like that. The power of the Spirit is real in people like that. And my prayer is that we can become a people like that once again. Because it seems to me that that's the place that God's resurrection power shows up. And for me, I don't want prestige. I don't want titles. I don't want books. I want to experience the resurrection of Christ. I want to know what it's like to be a part of movement of the Spirit. I want to find out what it's like to follow Jesus in a world in which He has ascended. 
and we rely on faith and that which is not seen. I want to one day stand before God the Father and account for my humble service and not the kingdom that I have built alongside of Christ's. And it seems to me that it's that sort of backward economy of the kingdom of God that is the sort of way that we're called to live in this in-between space between the ascension and the return of Christ. And my hope is to be a part of that. Would you pray with me? Lord, we've not found any answers today to what to do with the problems in our society. We've not broken new ground about how to live. But Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit in a fresh way. That you would overwhelm us with your presence in a way that allowed us to be faithful in an unfaithful world. I pray that you would speak to us in a way that helps us step in the footprints that Jesus would be leaving were he here today. For Lord, we want to be formed into your character, living as you, behaving like you, speaking like you, telling truth, but also speaking grace. Lord, help us as we consider what it means to be a follower of Jesus when we can't step in those dusty footprints. Help us to be embodied by the Spirit, driven out for mission, living in concert with your will for the sake of the world. Help us, O oh God, to be your people, fresh and new. And Lord, at this time, we pray as the way you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm not entirely sure how you all receive communion in your congregation, so I'm going to do it the best that I can in the way that I do it. And the way I, I prefer to do it is that you would come and receive the elements and then return to your seat, and then I, I will say a prayer and, um, and read a word of institution as you said. And so, um, at this time, I invite you to stand and to come, receive the elements, return to your seat with them.
the Apostle Paul gave us a gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in which he recounts the why of Holy Communion. So I'd like to read just a few words of that for the words of institution. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of, uh, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Take and eat and be thankful. This cup is the blood of Christ, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and be thankful. I believe at this time we're going to sing, uh, well, you played a prayer chorus, so I jumped right through, didn't I? Okay. I do the, uh, we're going to sing the hymnal, uh, from the hymnal, number 481, Where He Leads, I'll Follow. Receive the benediction. Go from this place with hearts open to where Christ would lead you, looking for his presence even as he has ascended to his throne, aware that the Spirit is driving you out into his world in order to be salt and light for all who come in contact with you. So even though it's hard to follow, be a follower. And in being a follower, lead the world to Christ. Go in peace. You are dismissed. <laughs>